and we are going to kick things off with Mike Fury, who is the Chief Administrative Officer for the Resort Municipality of Whistler. Over the past 30 years, Mike has worked in the federal, provincial, and municipal levels of government in Canada. He began his career with the Government of Canada for much of the 90s, uh, working in Vancouver as a federal negotiator on First Nation treaty agreements in British Columbia. His career also took him to Ottawa, where he held the position of National Policy Director with Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, and provided advice to federal cabinet ministers. In 2004, Mike joined the province of BC and held the position of assistant deputy minister across several portfolios, advising a number of ministers and cabinet, uh, including overseeing a billion dollars in municipal infrastructure grants. In 2011, he made the move to Whistler. There's no looking back now, Mike Fury. Uh, and we have had the pleasure of having Mike as our CAO there since 2011, and Mike's going to bring us up to speed on what's going on at the RMLW. Thanks, Mike. Great. Thank you, Mo, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? It's hard to know with this thing. Dean has given me the thumbs up. So I've got a number of slides I'm going to walk through, and uh, sitting up in the back, I thought it was working really well, and compliments to Pat and others who've organized this, that I think the material is fitting together uh, quite nicely in terms of providing a broad spectrum, and certainly with uh, Val's and others' presentations. So uh, interestingly, uh, uh, Pat spent some time on Squamish, and I thought I'd sort of start there a bit as well. And uh, as Pat noted, the Sea to Sky region, Whistler or Squamish, is number one in terms of growth across the province, followed by, by Whistler. Uh, it's a tremendous amount, I won't run through it again, but Pat mentioned all the economic drivers happening in Squamish, and certainly here in Whistler, and you can see that slot, the uh, little box on the bottom left, uh, that's the 2016 uh, census, it's probably well over 12,000 now and growing. So, and you put that into context, we have about 15,000 employees here. So, but that's our permanent population. So, uh, this is something which I'm going to, uh, the picture, I'll speak a little bit about transportation and, and uh, regional transit in a moment. I wanted to also uh, draw to your attention uh, what's been happening in terms of growth in the uh, non winter months. And there's a lot on this graph. And merited, hopefully you don't have this one, but if you look at each month on the far left-hand side is 2010 and on the far right is 2017. And you can see traditionally January, February, March, quite a lot of uh, you know, pretty high occupancy, occupancy meaning hotel occupancy. But if you move into particularly like April, May, and June, and just look at the growth in June from 2010 to 2017, it's been tremendous, and again in September, October, and November, a little bit slower. But really, it could almost fold winter onto uh, summer now in terms of uh, occupancy, and we actually have greater visitation uh, in the summer than in the winter. This is a, uh, a chart that we've used quite extensively, and there's a lot of information there, but I just want to focus on a couple of numbers. Uh, these two here, this represents we, about 2012, we hired some economists and some others to look at what's the economic engine of Whistler and did a lot of uh, analytical research, some statistical analysis, and we came up with uh, these, these uh, representative stats. And if you look at the top one, Whistler contributes $1.5 billion towards provincial GDP. And to put that in context, that's equivalent to the agricultural and fisheries sectors combined in British Columbia. We're sort of on par. So not bad for a community of 12,000. You also look at below that, we are uh, responsible for 25% of the total tourism export revenue. So that's visitors' uh, destination or, or outside of Canada uh, coming into British Columbia. So sort of pretty good dollars. Uh, coming in, and then this quick one up in, or sorry, down in the left end, 500 million a year. Surprisingly, that's in taxes that are generated. Surprisingly, most of those goes to the federal government. The province gets about 140 million, and you're probably aware we get uh, what's called Resort Municipality Initiative funding, RMI funding. Lots of local folks would have heard of that. It's about six and a half million a year. So we use this chart when we meet with the premier and ministers and say, we actually pay for our RMI money in about, uh, by January 10th. So uh, we've really earned it. So in terms of responding to the growth that folks have talked about, uh, we had the success over the last four or five years, 
have created, obviously, a lot of housing affordability and supply challenges, traffic congestion and parking, and particularly around what I'm calling the ever-evolving resort community characteristics, and I'll, I'll expand on that in a sec. So uh, Pat had mentioned our official community plan, or OCP. It's really our highest level uh, policy document. It sort of builds on our success to date. We're, up, we're in the process of almost finalizing the update of it. Uh, it's focused on that long-term economic viability, quality of life for residents, and trying to find the optimum resort carrying capacity. And when I say optimum resort carrying capacity, I don't mean as many people as we can stuff in the resort. It's what's optimum in terms of livability, guest experience, and tr making this uh, a great place to come. And so maintaining that mountain culture. And it's really, uh, it guides our ongoing evolution. So just in terms of, uh, a couple of others have referred to, we live very much in a cyclical uh, economic environment in Whistler. And if you look on the left-hand side, it's 2010 to 13, and today on the right-hand side is the current reality. So just to go through some of those numbers, uh, the occupancy rates, uh, occupancy, hotel occupancy rates were, were, were lower, average daily late rate was lower, we have strong occupancy. Look at the visitation, uh, we were around 2.3, now we're at 3.3, that's a million people more coming to the community in the space of about five years. Uh, again, in terms of employees, I mentioned 5,000, actually over that 50, or 15,800 uh, employees, and uh, just about five years ago, we were at 12,000. So there is a lot happening, and I think what's important to remember is the reality of going back to that time uh, needs to be kept in our mind all the time. We need to be thinking about economic resilience and not just thinking, well, we're here and we're always going to stay here. In terms of our community feedback, we, on our official community plan, we did do a lot of outreach, and we heard a lot of things. Uh, when we always have our open houses, we always get lots of good feedback. Uh, but three things that I picked out, one was around the overall busyness is placing stress on the resort community and its systems. And uh, I think people see that, you see that around you all the time in terms of that busyness. There's a concern over future growth. You know, where are we going? What is the capacity? Uh, how much can the resort uh, handle? But also, as I mentioned a moment ago, we need to plan for the economic cycles and bear in mind that change does happen. And as, as I think others have mentioned, we're very vulnerable to things like the US dollar, uh, international change and in, in, in instability in our various uh, destination uh, centers. So we have, uh, in terms of our updated OCP, some of the key acts, aspects, sort of responding to what I just spoke to, is adding more about sense of community and supporting a strong community life, sense of place, sense of belonging, and quality of life. And then some clarification around strengthening our policies for protecting the natural environment, things like our, our focus on zero waste, uh, water conservation, and improved transportation. And transportation sort of fits into a number of those, particularly around climate change and busyness. So in terms of trans transportation, we have done a lot over the last four years. We had a transportation advisory group uh, trying to understand the traffic patterns and how we can influence them. Some of them on the sea to sky are, are out of our reach, but we've done a lot of research and interestingly, uh, lots of interesting uh, information popped out of that. One, of, one was we, that we did some counting, traffic counters between uh, function and the village. And on weekends, particularly in the days and in, in uh, uh, late afternoon, a lot of our local traffic, about I'm gonna say 30%, and it could be as high as 40, or a lot of the traffic, sorry, on, uh, on that area is generated locally and not necessarily locals, but people who are here that churn. So it's not just new people coming in on a Saturday morning. There is a lot of traffic here just from people going from function and back and forth to the village. So in terms of addressing that, there were two key things. One was trying to get people out of their cars and onto the buses. So we tackled that by looking at parking and putting a price on parking, which was sort of always unpopular here. And we 
instead of taking that money from parking in the day lots and putting it into our general revenues, we put that into transit. So now, uh, pretty much for the entire summer, we have free transit on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, every weekend throughout the summer. And that has, uh, our counters have shown, it sort of stabilized and, and dropped a bit in terms of that traffic uh, being generated locally. But the ridership has gone up hugely. The other piece we've been working on, and again fits in what was talked about with Squamish, and we're doing this in uh, partnership with the Lillawat and Squamish Nations and the municipalities and the regional uh, district, uh, is looking at a regional transit, BC Transit, right from Mount Curry to Vancouver and all stops in between. So Mount Curry, Pemberton, Pemberton, Whistler, Whistler, back to Pemberton, Squamish, uh, Vancouver, Squamish, Whistler. And the reason why we did that, we had meetings with the provincial government and after the you know, 650 or $700 million investment in the highway uh, pre-Olympics, the message we got, there isn't a lot of money around for 100, you know, 200 million, hundreds of millions of dollars in concrete investments, which would be very costly in terms of counter, uh, you know, putting, drilling highways into the side of the mountains, et cetera, and trying to do widening. So we are uh, working on that, uh, uh, regional transit. Uh, we've we signed a memorandum of understanding. We're hoping to get funding uh, from the province of BC and possibly having it in place uh, this year, but more likely 2020. And uh, we see that as a, a, a real benefit. And I think from benefit from other what others have spoken about. If you look at that growth that's happening in Squamish and becoming sort of a bedroom community of Vancouver. That traffic that we see on the weekend, uh, we've done some modeling on it, and if, if er, all the build-out that Pat talked about happens, and there's about five to 6,000 uh, approved uh, units now or, or uh, uh, planned build, uh, we see in about 2025, I think, you're gonna get congestion like we see on a Friday or, or Saturday morning on the highway on almost a daily basis. So we really need to uh, take some action to get in front of that. Uh, so quickly, I couldn't, couldn't do uh, a presentation here without talking about housing. So uh, we have ha always targeted uh, driving to that 75% of employees living in Whistler. Uh, we're still at that. We're actually closer, surprisingly, uh, a little over 80% this year. Some of those numbers are dated here. Uh, and I'll speak to what we're doing around it. I wanted to show you this slide, which there's a lot of information on it, and I generally don't, don't like to use those, but if you, this is the rental mark, market rental rates in Whistler. And on the left-hand side, you have the various uh, income levels from 30,000 to 150, and then across the top, you have the market price per month for studios to single-family homes. And a general marker that we all sort of hear uh, from the banking sector is about 30% of your income should be spent on housing. So if you're looking at someone making $150,000 a year, which is a pretty healthy income, uh, they would be spending about 54% uh, of their income on the, a single family home here as a rental. So uh, we're, we're, the work we're doing, and I'll speak a little about the rental uh, employee housing rental we're, we're working on, is trying to bring it more down into that 30% range. And I'm not going to, we could have a whole afternoon on uh, rental rates, but I just wanted to put that up for illustrative purposes about the challenges around affordability. Just quickly, lots of you ha would have seen this before. The Whistler Housing Authority uh, has quite a few bills underway, four right here. Uh, one down in Chequemus Cloudburst opened in 2017, or 2017, 27 new units. Legacy Way, that should say 2019. Uh, 20, uh, 23 units there. Uh, there's another being planned on Cloudburst, which could have up to, it says 40, maybe uh, 50 rental units there. And then over in Rainbow, uh, there's a uh, project underway there that's targeted toward uh, seniors. So one of the big things we're looking for, I better add this piece, makes a little more sense, uh, is down in Chequemus. So uh, after the Olympics, uh, sorry, pre-Olympics, we received uh, land from the province as part of the 2010 games. 
And those two parcels that are sort of in that grayish color are lands that uh, are held by the municipality that are for housing development. Right now, we are focusing on that one in the red square. And a, a lot of work is underway uh, by the Whistler Development Corporation and uh, Councillor Dwayne Jackson, who I see over there, is our local housing guru, guru and our portfolio, uh, housing portfolio person. And uh, Dwayne and our team and WDC are doing a lot of work and hopefully uh, uh, moving forward, definitely moving forward this year, whether we break ground or not uh, will, be, uh, will be seen, but we definitely will be for next year. And that's going to be a very significant rental unit, could be uh, possibly over 100 units, not bed units, but actual apartments. So uh, that will be, uh, hopefully, uh, alleviate some of the challenges I spoke about a moment ago. So uh, I'm also really pleased uh, to be here today and uh, sharing this stage with Carrie and, and Maxine from Lillawat, and great to be here on the traditional territory of the Squamish and Lillawat nations. What we've been doing at the municipality is really trying to improve our relationships and grow our relationships with, uh, with our two nation neighbors. And in 2018, we signed a government to government protocol, really a, about a channel to make sure we focus on communication and relationship building. Our official community plan updates uh, has a, a section right up front that the nation's prepared that gets uh, inserted into the beginning of the OCP on their history and their, their history in Whistler. Uh, we have quite a few sections on really trying to build our relationship uh, culturally, economically, uh, getting uh, the more collaboration around the uh, tourism and education and other shared interests, and also uh, employment and training opportunities. And I'm sure Pete will probably speak a little bit to that some more. We also have, uh, we're looking at a, a land exchange between a parcel of land we, the municipality owns in up behind Emerald neighborhood. Uh, sorry, I'll say that backwards. Uh, the nations hold a piece of land up behind Emerald neighborhood and uh, the municipality holds a piece of land in uh, Cadenwood, the lower part of Cadenwood. So we're gonna look at a, a land exchange there and zoning for uh, market zoning for the nations to pursue uh, housing development in that area, in the Cadenwood area. Uh, and I think we all see the OCP as a, as a real reconciliation tool uh, between our communities. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, we wanna remain true to our mountain culture, manage our community impacts and economic success, continue to enhance the resiliency of our tourism economy and uh, sharing of benefits, respond to global economic climate change, and uh, we wouldn't be anywhere if we weren't uh, collaborating with our partners. So that's me, I hope it didn't go on too long though. Thank you very much.